Hi, everyone. Welcome to Game Day Central Extra, heading into week nine against the Jacksonville Jaguars. Alongside EJ Smith, I am Olivia Reiner. We've got lots to discuss as it relates to the Eagles coming off of their big win over the Cincinnati Bengals, a 37 to 17 victory. EJ, if you had to name one thing that you think was just like the most impressive aspect of this offense per, offense's performance, what would it be? Yeah, I would say that Jalen Hurts' performance stands out as particularly like encouraging in terms of just, I think in the lead up to the game, the Bengals game, we had felt maybe a little bit of consternation about the passing game, maybe feeling like it, you know, sort of lacked the rhythm uh, in those in the two games out of the bye week. Obviously, the Eagles won those games, and they were successful mostly with the ground attack. And there was a lot of talk about the team's identity. I think that we're starting to see the scheme really reflect the, the strengths of the Eagles' offense. You know, they're leaning on the run game, but they are, you know, kind of leveraging that running attack. You know, the Saquon Barkley's gravity on a defense. They're starting to leverage that with play action passes. And honestly, the result is that they've really kind of unlocked the middle of the field for Jalen Hurts. It's an area that we haven't seen him target typically throughout the season. And it's something that he really was a lot more comfortable doing against the Bengals. You know, there are examples of them having play action fakes that, uh, like I said, opened up space in the middle of the field. There have been some schemed up, you know, some route concepts that kind of got players, you know, running free in the middle of the field, you know, the touchdown pass to Devontae Smith stands out as one of those where, you know, it's a post route from, you know, Devontae starts to the slot and runs a post route. Jalen finds him 45 yards down the field. Uh, they had a play where Greg Calcaterra got it as open as you could probably expect to get uh, in an NFL game, uh, you know, running through the middle of the field. And again, I think, it, you know, those plays sort of show what the gravity of those players are, whether it's Saquon Barkley, A.J. Brown, Devontae Smith, you can really exploit a defense by kind of getting those guys into positions where they draw a lot of attention up space for others. So I think that, you know, when you look at Jalen's stats through the game, you know, he had, you know, he's top five in his career in terms of completion percentage, passer rating. Uh, you know, he was really, really efficient. You know, yards per attempt that was up there as well. So just one of his most efficient games of his career, honestly. So I definitely think that it was an encouraging step for the passing game, kind of figuring out what's going to work and what's not going to work, uh, you know, for Jalen Hurts. I agree with you there. I also want to add something too. I think the most encouraging aspect of the offense's performance to me, I agree, was Jalen Hurts. But the reason why he was able to do so much, not only as a passer, but also really like, you know, in the run game, too, and that involved Saquon Barkley, was because of the play of the offensive line just as a whole, especially considering the fact that they were missing two of their starters. They had Fred Johnson out there at left tackle starting in place of an injured Jordan Mailata. They had Tyler Steen out there at right guard starting in place of Mekhi Becton. And really this offensive line didn't miss a beat and kept Jalen Hurts clean for the majority of the day. Hurts was only pressured once. He was not sacked at all. Fred Johnson did a really impressive job going up against Trey Hendrickson, which I think was a really big concern going into this game, knowing that perhaps maybe the only real defensive play record potentially was Hendrickson and Johnson, the backup only allowed one pressure against him in, in 13 matchups. And according to next gen stats. So as a whole, I think because Hertz was kept so clean, he was able to do essentially whatever he wanted in the passing game. And as a result, he looked really quick and decisive in the pocket. He averaged 2.93 seconds to throw in that game, which is his second lowest average of the season. Uh, just getting the ball out relatively quickly, able to get into a rhythm um, and, and in turn making some really big plays. And I think as, in addition to that, because not only the, the, the pass protection was so strong in that game, we also saw a really dominant performance on the ground um, in the run game too, unlocking lots of opportunities for Saquon Barkley. And because Barkley was such a threat, you saw the ability for the, the play action game to blossom as well and taking advantage of the threat of the run to open up the passing game. And none of that is able to be accomplished without the dominance of the offensive line. So just as a whole, a really strong performance from that group that I think should be encouraging to Eagles fans going forward because you don't know what injuries are going to pop up. You don't know what's going to happen. So how, how big of a blessing is it the fact that you've got two starters out and this offensive line doesn't miss a beat? So offense, as we've already discussed, really, really encouraging performance from the group. But this defense, since the bye week, has really looked like a different defense under Vic Fangio the last three games. EJ, if you had to pick one defensive player who's really impressed you with his growth since week one, who would it be? 
Yeah, I'm going to cheat and take two. I'm going to take Zach Bond and Nicobe Dean because, you know, it's a partnership there. You know, I think that that linebacker partnership has really stood out to me. You know, when you think about all of the areas that the Eagles have improved on, I think they all do funnel down to one thing, which is that their run defense has been a lot better since the bye week, you know, and I think that the linebackers are instrumental in that. I think, you know, being able to stop the run on early downs has been able to unlock the pass rush for the Eagles defense. And I think it's also been able to kind of give the secondary a little bit more agency to take risks and be aggressive. You know, defensive coordinators always talk about, you know, when you're in a a known passing situation, that's really where your call sheet opens up. That's where you can be creative and you can kind of, you know, exploit all the things you do during the week, you know, and be able to use some of those things. So, you know, before the bye week, they were average, you know, they were giving up 128 yards per game. You know, we saw it, you know, there are a lot of manageable third downs, a lot of third and shorts where you can't really be aggressive because you're, you're, you're not sure if they're going to run it or they're going to pass it. Um, You know, so coming out of the bye week, they've only been giving up 70 yards, 78 yards uh, per game in the the last three games. And I think that really does kind of tell you the difference. And I think the linebackers are instrumental in that. You know, the team's two leading tacklers, you know, Zach Vaughn is leading the team and, uh, you know, Kobe Dean's number two. You know, Kobe Dean's been really good coming downhill, being aggressive, getting into the backfield. He's got a team high seven tackles for loss. He's got two and a half sacks. Vaughn's got two sacks. So they're both, you know, they've been disruptive coming downhill. And honestly, Vaughn has been really good at coverage. You know, that's something that stands out. If I had to pick one player, I probably would go with Vaughn just because of his, you know, what he's been able to do in coverage. He's only allowing 6.6 yards per reception, which is something tracked by Pro Football Focus. It's the seventh lowest, uh, you know, yards per uh, reception allowed in the NFL. PFF. So, you know, really impressive work from him moving backward. You know, when you think about the fact that he's converting, you know, from playing off-ball linebacker or playing an edge rusher, off-ball linebacker, it really stands out. You know, his growth. And I think that there is reasonable ex- a reasonable expectation that he will continue to improve the more that he plays in that position. Those are two very good selections simply because they were two of the biggest question marks going into this season. We didn't know how Nicobe Dean was going to look going into this year, his first full year as a starter. We didn't know how Zach Bond was going to look. Heck, we thought he was going to be a, an outside linebacker, an edge rusher going into the season. And now they've really held it down the last few games for the Eagles in the middle of the field. So certainly uh, they deserve their props. I am going to take one of the Eagles rookies here. I'm going with Cooper DeGene. I've been really impressed with his last few games since he earned that starting nickel cornerback role in place of Avante Maddox coming out of the bye week. DeGene was someone who we really didn't get to see a whole lot of in this defense to start the the season simply because he was working his way back. He was sidelined with an injury um, during a good portion of training camp. He really didn't get into the swing of things until that final preseason game against the Minnesota Vikings. And he was really shaky in that game. Um, and he admitted it himself. It was it was not his best performance. Um, and he has cleaned up, I think, a lot since then. And it's clearly gotten a lot more comfortable in the defense. He made a really impressive fourth down stop against Jamar Chase um, on, on Sunday against the, the Bengals. Um, just, you know, a very veteran play, essentially. That was what C.J. Gardner-Johnson was talking about after the game, is that just the ability for this rookie to not get fooled by Chase on this motion in the backfield and to be disciplined with his eyes and to, to, to stay continue to track him and, and to make that tackle, too. I think it's not just the ability to understand mentally what's happening, but to also execute And I think the physicality that he has brought to this role, especially over Avante Maddox, has been very impressive. DeGean in his last three games has only missed two tackles. Missed tackles, EJ, as as we've discussed, is particularly in the run game, but just kind of really all over the field, these open field tackles too. In the passing game, the Eagles defense had struggled to start the season. It was magnified in that week four game against the Tampa Bay Buccaneers when I think they had like 16 missed tackles and they've really cleaned up since then. And I think that DeGene and just his physicality, his intelligence for a rookie has been really impressive. Uh, he, it, Among slot cornerbacks with at least 45 snaps in coverage, he ranks ninth in the league in passer rating against, according to Pro Football Focus. So, um, you know, just impressive play all around from the young rookie cornerback. And he's got um, certainly things to improve on and, and a lot of work to continue to do, but some encouraging signs going forward for this Eagles secondary. All right, EJ, as we know, the NFL trade deadline is rapidly approaching. Howie Roseman has a history of liking to make some moves around this time of year. In his last seven seasons here, he has uh, made, made trade moves at, at six in six of those uh, trade deadline um, situations. I think my big question for you is, 
what are the Eagles going to do? If, if you had, if there is a scenario in which you could see Roseman making a deal going into the trade deadline, what, which position do you think he would target? Yeah, like you said, I think that you can expect them to be active at the very least. High Rosen's track record suggests as much. Um, you know, when you look at positions that they they could potentially target, I, I, it's not a, there's no glaring ones. You know, years past, there has definitely been a case. That, you know, there have been times where it's like, man, they could really use somebody. I mean, what stands out to me is edge rusher, uh, tight end, defensive tackle, really pass rush in general is what I would say stands out. You know, tight end. I don't think there's necessarily like a clean fit for tight end. There's some guys that you could add. But, you know, I think that they would be looking more for like an impact player than, you know, just a guy who could, you know, kind of join the rotation. So if you're thinking about pass rusher, like, you know, you mentioned their history, they they typically do like to, you know, look into like they've brought in players that are, you know, maybe aging veterans on expiring contracts, guys who have been productive in the NFL that maybe, you know, could just kind of be like a playoff push type type of player, you know, somebody who you can rent for half a season to kind of help you as the games kind of get more important. I think that Zadarius Smith on the Cleveland Browns would fit that profile pretty well. You know, he's a guy who's played well in his career. He's got, I believe he's got five sacks so far this season. So he's someone that would fit kind of what they've done in the past. Now, like you mentioned, they haven't necessarily done great in those acquisitions. You know, it's hard to integrate somebody mid season, you know, these aging veterans, sometimes they're not quite the player that, you know, their name recognition may suggest. So, you know, if you're looking for somebody, you know, Vic Fangio mentioned having guys who maybe could be a part of the project for more than just half a season. If you're looking at guys like that, I think the Baron Brown, Baron Browning on the Denver Broncos makes sense in that regard, because he's somebody who was drafted by Vic Fangio. He came in as an off ball linebacker. He switched to edge rusher. He's on the final year of his deal, but I think it would be reasonable to extend him because of his track record in the NFL. His production isn't quite what, uh, you know, Zadarius Smith's is, but still I think that he's an intriguing player that could kind of fit into, uh, you know, that edge rusher rotation. I think that, you know, if you want to kind of dream here, like, you know, we could do some unrealistic, but, you know, probably ideal type of uh, additions. I don't think that Miles Garrett, you know, the Cleveland Browns as all pro, all world, whatever you want to call them, edge rusher. I don't think that he's really going to become available, even though the Browns aren't playing great. Max Crosby, the Raiders have basically come out and said he's not available. One that I, you know, I'm slightly intrigued by, I don't know how realistic it is. The, the Titans that don't seem interested in trading this guy, but I think Jeffrey Simmons could be an interesting one. You know, these, all three of these, I'd say, like, these are the types of players, if they became available, they'd make sense for the Eagles because they are impact players. They're long-term fits. They're basically star players. You know, the Eagles have been interested in guys like that in the past. You know, Mika Fitzpatrick and Jalen Ramsey come to mind as two guys that I think the Eagles would have liked to acquire them, but it just didn't work out for whatever reason. So if any of those guys became available, you know, whether it's Garrett, Crosby, or Simmons, I could see the Eagles definitely making – you're trying to move heaven and earth to get them just because of their caliber, the type of caliber player they are. Simmons is interesting to me because he's an interior rusher. I think the Eagles could still use some help on that interior in terms of getting, uh, you know, just consistent pass rush from those guys. Um, you know, obviously Jalen Carter's played really well. Milton Williams has played pretty well. And then you have more Ojomo and Thomas Booker has been good rotational pieces, but they could use a star kind of next to Jeffrey Simmons. We've seen the Eagles kind of constructed that way before, you know, with Fletcher Cox and Javon Hargrave. When you have two dynamic interior rushers, it really does kind of put defense or put opposing offensive linemen uh, in a bind because you can't double team everybody. So, yeah, I don't know if those guys are necessarily realistic. I don't think that, you, know, you could really bank on any of them getting traded. But, you know, crazy things happen at the trade deadline. If any of them were available, I do think it would make sense considering where the team sits right now to try and win for one of those impact players. Mm -hmm. EJ, I hear you out. I understand you are thinking of the situation in an ideal world um, who might be available, who might fit the price point that the Eagles are willing to spend. I think that they should just bag it. <laughs> I don't even know if it's worth it for them to try to make, especially not a big splashy move going into the trade deadline. I think they've got a group that is buzzing right now. Um, and I don't really know who is out there that could be worth bringing in for them, given the history that the Eagles have here, just in terms of how these trade deadline acquisitions tend to go. Um, I also think that they're in a position right now where they are pretty healthy across the board um, and they're getting healthier with uh, Mikhail Becton expected to come back. You think uh, um, we're talking uh, Dallas Goddard too is coming, will likely come back soon. Um, Jordan Mailata. So like the, the things that the Eagles are, are currently dealing with, it's not necessarily a, a health issue. Um, like last year, I felt like when they went after Kevin Byer, the Eagles were really thin at safety. Um, just yeah, depth and, and health wise, um, 
And this time around going into the trade deadline, I think the defense is in a bit of a different place. We heard from Vic Fangio yesterday talk a little bit about just kind of how these trade deadline acquisitions this time of year don't necessarily pan out or or do the things that maybe you you would hope them to do um, in his experience. So I would just be hesitant to go and and try to spend a lot to go go get a guy. The Eagles already tried to kind of do that in a way in acquiring Jahan Dodson in season this year, flipping a third round pick to get him. Um, And so far he ranks second to last in the league in yards per route run. And so you're looking at, you know, a third round pick out, you know, pretty much gone now. It it is gone now um, in an effort to try to bring him in and and get him involved in the, in the offense. But we've seen um, maybe more, more veteran wide receivers, um, make impacts in their new homes this season um, at the, you know, at, at, via trade and um, not necessarily not cost as much essentially. So um, I'm, I'm not so sure that it makes the most sense really for the Eagles to go after someone, but we'll see it. Like we already mentioned how Roseman has this history of doing something at the trade deadline. I don't think it is necessarily a must do um going into this year but that's just my opinion we'll see what happens all right everyone that's going to do it for us for game day central extra thanks so much for joining us and we'll see you next time